We're going to talk about something really uh, exciting and that I'm um, very uh, passionate about, which is technology, how that's changing the way we practice. So we'll get things started. My disclosure have not changed. Um, so in this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about the opportunities and challenges of telemedicine. I'm also uh, going to talk about some of the useful phone apps that I have found helpful uh, for me in my clinical practice. And then finally, we're going to end with uh, artificial intelligence, where it is today in terms of uh, our field and where do we think uh, it's going. So first, um, I think that the word teledermatology oftentimes evokes uh, some sense of excitement, but oftentimes also loathing uh, among uh, a lot of the practitioners. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what can be some of the advantages of this modality, uh, but also uh, the challenges that we have faced. So undoubtedly, telehealth is rapidly shaping the future of medicine. And here what we are seeing is a graph that shows from, for example, 2010 to uh, 2015 where the growth had been. And you will notice that there is a lighter blue uh, line that's uh, pretty much that didn't grow as much. So those are the states that do not have parity uh, reimbursement. So they don't reimburse uh, telemedicine uh, versus the states, uh, that, which is the middle line here, that do uh, reimburse telemedicine at the time. And the top line is really the total. So we're, what, we, what we're seeing in general is that the total number of telehealth visits across all specialties have increased. And if we're looking into the future, this is the US uh, virtual visit market size uh, by service type uh, into 2027. So what we're looking at here is really overall as a country in terms of the use of virtual visits is projected to grow exponentially. And it's gonna be most likely in the area of, for example, cold and flu management, allergy management, urgent care, preventive care, and something that's more relevant to our field, oftentimes chronic care management, especially for chronic inflammatory skin diseases and also behavioral health. So about four to five years, um, if I rewind the time, uh, back and, and have been interesting telemedicine for a while, uh, I, I looked at what are some of the evidence gap at the time in the field. So this is all pre-pandemic. And one thing I noticed in dermatology is that while we had a lot of studies that looked at uh, diagnostic accuracy or management concordance between in-person versus uh, telemedicine modalities of delivery, what was lacking was no, there weren't a lot of studies actually looking at patient outcome, whether the patient outcomes were the same, whether you delivered telemedicine or whether you delivered uh, the care uh, through in-person. So with funding from PCORI, which is a patient-centered research institute, uh, we uh, did a study where we recruited 300 patients with psoriasis, and then we randomized them into either being cared for in person versus online. And uh, the frequency of the visits, we followed them for a year, and the frequency of the visits are really just dictated naturally by their disease severity or their discussion with their uh, primary, with their, with their dermatologist, um, as well as their primary care physicians, as well as their uh, dermatology care team. But every three months, we would give them um, uh, assessments to look at, uh, in a controlled fashion, uh, their, their outcomes in terms of disease severity and their satisfaction. So here are some pictures from a patient who was in the online group. So they were told to how to take photos of their skin lesions, and they sent it in. So this was all asynchronous telemedicine. How many of you think that you can sort of look at the psoriasis disease severity with some confidence based on those photos? Okay, so some of you have raised your hand. So what we learned is that uh, when we're looking at these photos of patients, obviously the photo, uh, the photograph uh, quality uh, vary depending on the person, but for inflammatory skin disease, there may be an opportunity there, especially if you've already seen the person uh, in person and are confident about your initial diagnosis. 
And what was interesting was that we, so we tracked these patients' disease severity over time. And what was found uh, is that if we look at the graph on the left-hand side, so the online group are the red dots and the in-person group are the blue circles. They pretty tracked pretty similarly over time. And as you can see, this is a group that has already been followed, so their baseline is not have very high disease severity, but over time for maintenance, it seems to be quite similar with regards to patient outcomes. And in fact, there were, uh, when we did the statistical testing, it's considered equivalent with regards to their POSI score um, over a year period of time. What about patient global assessment? So this is patients' overall assessment of how their psoriasis is doing. And what was found was that the patients actually thought their psoriasis uh, was a little bit better controlled in the online group. I think partly that may be due to the fact that they may be more satisfied potentially with not needing to travel to the dermatologist's office at the time. We also looked at the difference in terms of access to care. So on the left-hand side is the total distance that's traveled uh, by the in-person group, and on the right-hand side is by the online group. The online patients could, it was a pragmatic trial, so if they felt like the telemedicine didn't work, they could see us in person. We just essentially kept track of that. So as you can see, big difference in terms of distance travel or the amount of time that they needed to wait uh, in the office or spent in transportation. So following that study, so we learned a lot about that study, but following that study, about two years after the results were published was when the COVID pandemic hit. And I would say that really changed the adoption of telemedicine from something that's pretty fringy to something that was mainstream. And so how many of you, by a show of hands, uh, have done telemedicine during COVID? Yeah, so I would say almost all of you um, have done that. And how many of you um, hated it? <laughs> I see a majority of you hated it. So, um, and, and uh, here's a question for us. So uh, what, do you, uh, what do you say most commonly during, to your patients during video-based teledermatology visit? And it could be different. So is it A, remember to reapply your sunscreen? B, can you go to a place with better lighting? C, put your foot on the desk so I can see it. Or D, I can't hear you. D, yes, yeah, that's, uh, I agree. That's what I, I say most often. And uh, I'm always waiting for that connect to audio dot, dot, dot to, uh, to finish uh, uh, for the patient to, to connect. So in nearly every teledermatology clinic I have, I always have some kind of technical issue, even though I've done it for a very long time myself. And uh, certainly it's ripe with uh, some challenges. And I think when we look at telemedicine, really the sustainability and the scalability of telemedicine, I think really depends a lot on the economics of the practice. And when we look at the literature, most of the literature actually takes a societal perspective. So they account for the patient's time spent in traffic and all that, and then they balance that with the cost of the care. And I think that's very important for the society to understand. But at the individual level, at our practice level, that may not be as relevant. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the perspective uh, from an individual uh, a provider's perspective. And, and again, to emphasize a point that intervention may be cost-saving or may not be cost-saving depending on the economic perspective that you're taking. Okay, so here we're going to take the perspective of of all of us here, which are individual dermatology uh, providers practicing teledermatology in a primarily fee-for-service fee setting. So probably the biggest challenge for teledermatology is still time. And when we think about asynchronous teledermatology, it's oftentimes, I would say, billed as something that is very efficient, because you can just look at the images, make a diagnosis, make a recommendation and go on. But as many of you have found during the pandemic that you oftentimes are looking at poor quality images 
or incomplete sets of images. And in fact, if you get incomplete sets of images, that can be a little bit dangerous. Um, I oftentimes make the analogy of, of tele, teledermatology in terms of the image set you get, similar to, let's say, uh, di uh, biopsying. So if you biopsy the wrong site, you will note what the person has. Or if you're given the wrong set of images, actually the real crux of the images weren't given to you, you really can make a good diagnosis. And oftentimes there can be insufficient history. So a lot, of times can, a lot of time can be spent obtaining adequate images or adequate history from the patient. What about synchronous teledermatology? We know that patients are actually most happy with when they can get online and then communicate with you directly. But as probably most of you have experienced during this time that there's oftentimes bad internet connection, the patient is on the phone or in the car, you know, in, the, in their car and, or in the place that they may not be able to show you all the skin lesions. But a lot of the technical difficulties and challenges can uh, really uh, chew up the time that you have for the visit. So to make it more efficient, thinking about ways in which we can optimize uh, the technology aspect and the way we practice so that we can uh, save the time we have in order to, to provide care to, to more patients. There are also a few lost opportunities in terms of telemedicine. Um, that is, for example, uh, you may not be able to uncover other incidental findings or, or clinically important things um, that you would otherwise do in person. And also, of course, the inability to perform the procedure. And, and this is, occurs when you have a patient when you feel like they have something you can't see well or something that does need a procedure right away, they still would have to wait for an in-person appointment to see you. So those are some of the sort of the challenges of telemedicine, and sometimes what may seem like advantages may actually not be advantages depending on the technology you have and uh, also, also patients' varying level of comfort with the technology. However, there are also potential economic advantages from our perspective as well. And one of the things pre-pandemic that we looked at um, when telemedicine is still fringy and we were doing that for mostly research purposes was that we noted that the distribution of practitioners practicing telederm, there's a bimodal age distribution. So it's either people who have just sort of graduated or people who are near retirement. And we wanted to look at that to see why that's the reason, especially for, patients, uh, for, for practitioners who are near retirement age. And what we found was that a lot of times they found that there was no need no longer to maintain a brick and mortar office with telemedicine, but they still had a lot of clinical knowledge that they can offer to the patients. And also, in those, both of those groups, they love not, being a, not needing to commute to work. So I do think that during and post-pandemic, telemedicine will continue to expand. A lot of how much it will expand uh, after the pandemic will depend keenly on reimbursement. So a lot, some of the states are already reverting or, or on the course to revert their reimbursement laws to the pre-pandemic er, era, which is not covered for some of the telemedicine services. Other states are still figuring out what, what they want to do, but certainly reimbursement for telemedicine will drive a lot of uh, what I think is the adoption of telemedicine. So if you're curious about your state, um, I put here a resource that you can uh, look into. It's the Center for Connected Health Policy. Um, it is a nonprofit national telehealth policy resource center. Uh, so it will have federal policies, then you can search for your state and has information uh, state by state there. Okay, I'm gonna to transition to the middle part of my talk, which is um, three useful phone apps for clinical practice. And I would really be curious to see how many of you may already have those uh, apps uh, on your phone. And I use these three apps all the time. So the first one is Visual DX. Um, so what Visual DX, oh, before I start, how many of you use Visual DX or have Visual DX? Okay, so I think about half of you. Um, so Visual DX is um, a decision support system where, um, in its original uh, 
in its original version, you, type, you sort of select, you know, is it a papule versus a vesicle, and then you can put in uh, various history, and then essentially it pop up these differential diagnoses uh, for you. So it's a decision aid tool, as well as I actually use it very frequently in the clinic to show the patient um, what they have is what I'm trying to say that they have, so that they will believe me about what I'm saying. So. <laughs> And uh, it, it's actually quite, uh, quite effective. So, um, and I will pick the picture that looks most like their lesion. Because those of you who use Visual DS will know there are like lots of pictures, and some of them are in you know, areas that you're picking. So I pick the one that looks most like the patient, and then I, then I turn my monitor around. It's like, see, this is what you have. And then they go, oh, OK. Yeah, I sort of believe you now. Um, so I actually use that quite a bit. But Visual DX does have an add-on feature now. I don't know how many of you have that. It's called Optional Derm Expert Add-on. It's 100 bucks additional. I, I, I got that to test it out for, for, the, uh, for this lecture. It's where you basically can take a picture of a lesion. And then um, I thought you don't have to go through the questions anymore, but it turns out you still have to go through the questions. I was like, oh. And then, um, but, but then what happens is that then it gives you, it allows you to go through the questions quicker, because I think it has image recognition system. So it suggests a papule. So, so you don't have to kind of select as, slow, as, as slowly. But then it, then it gives you a differential diagnosis of, of, of the various lesions that it could be. So it's not as what I had imagined. I thought you took a picture and it says 95% this, but you still have to enter the info. So, uh, oh, by the way, no, no conflict interest uh, with, vi with Visual DX. But uh, um, I, I suggest if you're interested in that, um, you may want to try it out before you, you buy it. And uh, um, Visual DX, it's, um, it's not inexpensive. So I, I'm not sure how many of your practice already have it, but therefore, for those I know affiliated with academic centers, uh, a lot of academic centers uh, do have that. OK. How many of you have Hippocrates downloaded on your phone? Great, great. So I love Hippocrates. It's free, and it has the dosing. So if you can't remember what it is, you can put in the medication. It has the indication, the dosing. It has pill pictures. It has two pictures. So if your patient said, well, it's that like yellow tube. And you're like, well, could it be this medication? So you can actually look it up. I wish you can look up yellow tubes, and then it give you the options. But it doesn't do that quite yet. But I do find it quite helpful and useful in terms of uh, just referencing the different drug dosing uh, in, in that regard. OK, how many of you use GoodRx for your patients? OK, I think a third of you. So super helpful um, for the patients. And then GoodRx, you can type in the medication, and then your patients can find the coupon. They can bring the coupon to their pharmacy and, uh, um, and enjoy discounts. So, and that is free as well. So I, I've looked at a number of few other apps, and, and I've used some, but then I didn't quite like some others. So if you have suggestions uh, for, for other apps that you like, please do let me know. OK. The remaining uh, three and a half minutes, I'm going to talk about augmented intelligence, which is something that has definitely come to the field of dermatology. I should say, when I was trained during residency, I did not see that coming at all. Uh, but it is coming, and it actually meant a lot of it is here already. Uh, but before I start that, uh, I want to ask a question. Which game do you think is the oldest game in the world among the choices given? Is it chess, blackjack, go, Texas Hold'em, or World of Warcraft? You can shout it out. OK, I heard chess, go, I heard go. OK, did I hear Texas Hold'em? No, OK, if you chose that, you've already spent too much time on the casino floor. <laughs> so Go, among the ones that are given choices, is the, uh, one of the oldest games in the world. And the objective of Go, Go is to surround more territories than your opponent. So it only has a, a, a black piece and a white piece. So the objective is surround more uh, territory than your opponent. So it seemed like a very simple objective. But the number of Go moves is 10 to the 100 
70th compared to the number of atoms in the universe is only 10 to the 80th. So the number of Go moves is really tremendous. And Go typically cannot be solved by brute force or be predicted. So in 2016, an AI program called AlphaGo uh, was, uh, was put on the spot to, uh, to compete against Lee Siddle, who was at the time the world Go champion. And AlphaGo, this computer program, beat Lee four to one. So you may ask, how did it do that? So essentially what AlphaGo did is that it learned through millions of games and it also made up new moves that hasn't seen in human history. But what's more remarkable is that a year later, this newer version called AlphaGo Zero, I don't know why they named AlphaGo Zero, it should be like AlphaGo 100 or something, versus AlphaGo, what was shown is that AlphaGo Zero, the newer version, beat the older version of artificial intelligence 100 to zero. And what's more, more remarkable is that AlphaGo Zero learned to play with no human interaction and no historical data. It played by itself. So this program played by itself, it basically learned from itself. And in 40 days, essentially AlphaGo Zero surpassed over 3,000 years of human knowledge for the game Go. So it's a little scary, but it begs the question, perhaps there's more non-human intelligence about the game Go than there is human intelligence. So why am I drawing on and on about the game Go? Is to really have us think about the question a little bit differently. And really think about, is there more non-human intelligence about the skin than human intelligence? Okay, so that brings me to AI in dermatology, which currently are basically in two different areas. One is diagnostic support, uh, similar to visual DX I talked about, and then two is in decision support for management. So how many of you have heard of the Google AI-powered dermatology tool? Okay, so very few of you have heard but it is already approved as a class one medical device in the European Union. It is not currently available in the US. But essentially, in May of this year, Google revealed this Google AI powered dermatology tool where your patient, I suspect in the very near future, can take a, a, a picture of a lesion. And then, much like Visual DX, it will then suggest the diagnosis to the patient. And so in this particular case, they have a video, um, but it, it will suggest melanocytic nevi. It will also suggest what other things it could be. And then also, not only that, it tells them what are the, you know, what are the management things following that. So I got super upset when I saw that. I'm like, oh no, that's gonna replace us. Um, and, and could that still be possible? I mean, there's a, a slight fear still, uh, Amy, but, but this has been approved as a medical device in the EU, but I'm pretty sure it's coming to us very quickly. And it's Google, so it has lots of data. So you say, how did this all happen? So, so the way that um, augmented intelligence works, aside from the Google conversation, is that you can essentially take pictures, either clinical or dermoscopic images, with the path uh, confirmation. And what you can do is so you can create what's called a neural network. You essentially um, parcel the skin disease into these different parts with the diagnosis that you know are, are pathologically confirmed. So you can feed this system additional images so it recognizes not only the classic presentations of a disease, but also the different variants, as long as, in my opinion, they should all be pathologically uh, confirmed by a derm path. And so there are a few programs that have been, um, that have been essentially created, uh, and then people have published on this. So um, essentially, once you have the program created, you can have a new image lesion, such as on the left-hand side, you can have what looks like a melanocytic lesion. You can put it into this convol uh, conv convolutional neural network so that the algorithm recognizes this image, it compares with its existing known images that it has, and this spits out a probability. 
So in this case, I'll say it's 92%. This is represent a ma malignant melanocytic lesion, uh, and 8% uh, that it may be benign. So that's essentially how the, the, some of the existing um, augmented intelligence in terms of a derm uh, diagnose, diagnostic programs work. So how did it do? So there are two studies I'm going to show. So in Germany, they, they created this program, and they uh, did a study, machine versus German dermatologists. OK. So what they did, so here's a result. So what you want to see, so they have sensitivity on the y-axis and the specific, one minus specificity on the x-axis. So a perfectly performing algorithm would have a line that's really hugging the edge of the square. And so as you can see here, most of the dermatologists here fell below the blue line. So the blue line is the augmented intelligence, and the red dots are the in, represent each individual dermatologist. So as you can see, the majority of the dermatologists fell below the, derm, uh, the line, which means that they did inferior to this machine algorithm. And a few, as you can see, are on the line or above. Uh, so on average, it didn't do as well as a machine. You're like, ah, those are German dermatologists. <laughs> what about here, US dermatologists? So, so this is a uh, machine algorithm that was created at the Stanford at the time. So they also looked at this. So here, it's sort of the same, uh, same graph, except it's not one minus specificity. And then the way they presented data is a little different. But a perfectly performing algorithm would have the blue line, for example, hugging the, in the edge. Okay, The more in the middle, the more inferior the performance is. So, so we'll just start with carcinoma on the left-hand side. So they, they tested the machine and uh, 20 dermatologists of 135 images for carcinoma. And the, the green cross is the average. So what you will notice is that uh, essentially all except one dermatologist performed a little bit better than the machine. And uh, um, I, I, I actually sort of know about this study. And, and what's interesting is that they didn't tell the dermatologist which one the dermatologist performed better than the machine. And the irony is that every one of them that I talk to, they think they're the one. Um, <laughs> So, but, but the take home from this is that whether it's looking at carcinoma clinical images, melanoma clinical images, or melanoma uh, dermos, dermoscopic images, on average, most derms did not perform as well as the machine in terms of diagnosis. Okay, now we're really scared, but, uh, um, but I did want to talk about uh, briefly the limitations of AI. Um, the quality of the, the, the augmented intelligence of these convolutional neural network that I show you is really dependent on the images that you take and that you need to have pathologic um, confirmation. Otherwise, it's garbage in and garbage out. So how the algorithm is made sometimes can be a black box, but it's important to understand it because that tells you the quality of the ultimate uh, outcome in terms of the prediction. And, uh, and then still, they, they will tell you a range of possibilities. None of the programs tell you it's definitively this and nothing else. And I think that's probably healthy. Um, and the reason because that oftentimes there, there is diagnostic uncertainty. So knowing that the percentage of the different uh, differential diagnosis would be helpful. So with that, I will end with a quote by Eric Topol, who said that the greatest opportunity offered by AI is not reducing errors or workloads or even curing cancer. It's the opportunity to restore the precious and time-honored connection and trust. And he's referring to the time-honored connection and trust with our patients. So hopefully you'll see AI, and hopefully AI will evolve into a tool that will allow you to spend more time developing that connection with your patients and will be something that will help to increase our diagnostic accuracy. So with that, I want to just thank you for the time that I have spent with you um, today. And I will give the floor back to Joe. Thank you. <laughs>